Thank you very much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Fred Mark Udo from the Institute of Arts and Sciences, Department of Language and Literature, your moderator for this webinar. Today, we are presenting Language and Literature the Way to Law. We are grateful to have a speaker who is knowledgeable and experienced about the relationship and importance of language and literature in the field of law. We are also joined by a panel of reactors who will share their insights about today's discussion. We will also have a Q&A later to address uh, your questions. And uh, so for those of you who are interested in taking language and literature program, and after um, taking the program, get, go into the law school, this webinar is definitely for you. Uh, to ensure the smooth and organized flow of our webinar, I would like to remind our attendees of some webinar guidelines, which we are flashing now on the screen. Okay, before we proceed further, we would like to share with you video clips. These videos will provide us more information about what it's like to be an FU Tamarau, and of course, what FU's language and literature program has to offer. Here in FEU, we stand for future-ready learning, for continued education, not just for our students, but also for ourselves. Because by learning more about our students, we learn how to be better educators. For educational innovations, because better, more responsive teaching techniques that put emphasis on learning instead of just passing, help our students be better prepared for the future for turning knowledge into wisdom, not just accumulating it, so we can fulfill the potential of every student to be a future leader, and not just an achiever. We are FEU, and we stand for a future-ready generation. We stand for future-ready learning. One of the undergraduate programs in FEU is uh, BA in Language and Literature Studies. Um, Ms. Anne, next slide, please. So um, Bachelor of Arts in Language and Literature Studies has two tracks. One is the English track and the other track is Literature. Both uh, tracks are Pakokoa Level 2 accredited. And for you to get to know more about this program, we also have a video clip. Uh, that we would like you to watch. So aside from the undergraduate uh, program, you, uh, we also have ready. the The English language circle is here to provide knowledge, entertainment, and to show you the importance of language as it continues to connect bridges all around the world. Stand out. Let your talents be unleashed this academic year 2020-2021.
So aside from the undergraduate uh, program, BA in Language and Literature, we also have a graduate program, MA Letters. So the Master of Arts in Letters is a 42 year oddly inclusive program at, um, at, with advanced studies in literature with a particular focus on national and world literatures, literary theory and criticisms, and research and creative writing. This equips students with training and scholarly backgrounds for further studies in the field. Next slide, Ms. Anne. And if you guys are wondering how we conduct classes that we are now in the middle of the pandemic, in FEU, we conduct our classes online. Uh, we have three modes of learning. One is mixed online learning, asynchronous online learning, and we have the TAL or the total analog learning. For more information, if you have questions about the program, uh, especially about language and literature, feel free to email us at ils at feu.edu.ph, or you can also visit our Facebook oh. page, FEU Language Literature. Before we listen to our resource speaker and reactors, I would like to call on the chair of the FEU Department of Language and Literature, Dr. Emmanuel Gonzalez, for the opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Ben Mar. Naririnig ba ko? Yes, sir. Loud and clear. Okay. In behalf of our Dean, Dr. Rowena Capulong Reyes, and Associate Dean, Mark Isla, it's my pleasure to welcome you all here in the Department of Language and Literature webinar series. Today's webinar is focused on language and literature, the way to law. As the title says, we are giving you some insights on how language and literature can be used in pursuing a law degree. As per our tradition in choosing a preparatory degree to law, we usually take political science, legal management, or even psychology. We always put English language and literature to the last option. But now we will be enlightened on this issue on why we need to choose the language and literature for a law degree. Law and literature is considered by many to be nothing more than opposite wordplay contrived to create a certain image or interpretation in the minds of the readers or even listeners. Law is a manifestation of the will of the people as well as their interests. It is a reflection of our social norms, beliefs, and customs. The comparison between the law and language and literature has attracted the attention of many Western scholars in recent years. This scholar had also ex uh, expanded a great deal of effort in examining the relations within these two topics. Although it might be considered as a known area in the past, this newly prospect has started to sprout nowadays. In fact, many of our lawyers in the past bar exam has literature or language bachelor's degree. In order to prepare for the exam and uh, for the law school, the American Bar Association or even the Philippine Bar Association recommend students take courses that strengthen their writing skills and research skills, as well as pursue major that develop skills in problem solving and in analytical reading, editing, and oral communication. It's not surprised that many of pre-law students choose English language and literature as their major. Law, lawmakers characteristically use language to make law, and law must provide for the authoritative resolution of disputes over effects of that use of language, which make it language and literature plus law equals a winning combination. It is an excellent preparation for law school the English language and literature are pre-law major things together that most relevant skills and context for a legal career. 
And to top it all, I wish to thank our speaker for today's webinar, uh, Atoanio Seduk uh, Bagulaya, for accepting our invitation to share his expertise. I recognize that he had taken time and made the extra effort to make this webinar possible. I also thank our faculty and our staff, Ms. Ansel Isai, who helped us on this event. And of course, the guest teachers and students from senior high school, yeah, madami sila dyan ngayon dito, uh, who are now preparing for their future career. We, not, we look forward to seeing you soon in FEU, particularly in the Department of Language and Literature. So, pag wala na yung mga pandemic na ito, no? And let us continue our journey in FEU, the Future Ready University for you. Welcome and have a full, uh, fruitful and enjoyable webinar today. Muli, maraming salamat at mabungang pagpapalita ng ating pananaw sa lahat. Maraming salamat. Thank you very much, Dr. Gonzalez. Before we proceed further, I would like to take this time to greet and welcome our attendees. I will mention the names of the schools uh, present today. And if you are from that school, I would like you to make some noise in the meeting chat and let everyone know that you are here. We are starting off with Bangalore Central University in India. Welcome. Adventist University of the Philippines. Aralio High School, Cagayan National Senior High School in Tugigarao City, Rockwell University, Cavite State University, Central Bicol State University of Agriculture, Central Luzon State University, Children of Mary Immaculate College, Coron School of Fisheries, DepEd SD of San Pablo City, Laguna, Emilio Far Eastern University, Manila. Far Eastern University High School. FEU Roosevelt in Cainta and Marikina. General Pantal uh, Pantalion Garcia Senior High School. Governor Alfonso D. Tan College. Hello po sa inyo. Jafer Training and Development Services. Laguna State Polytechnic University. La Salette University School of Law, Leyte Normal University, Lyceum of the Philippines University, Manila, Manuel G. Araulio High School, Senior High School, Marinduque State University, Mindanao State University, Iligan Institute of Technology, More Academy, NEUSD, New Era University, Notre Dame of Holo College, Our Lady of Fatima University, Pace Academy, Pamantasan Lungsod ng, May ng Muntin Lupa, Paranaque National High School, Philippine Christian University College of Law, Polytechnic University of the Philippines, Rizal Technological University, Romblon State University, San Beda, San Felipe Neri Catholic School, San Pablo Colleges, Signal Village National High School, SSCR, Panza National Comprehensive High School, Tomas del Rosario College, TUP Manila, University of Eastern Philippines, University of Iloilo, University of Macau, University of Northern Philippines, University of Rizal System, University of the Philippines de Leman, University of Santo Tomas, UST Angelicum College, Vietnamese American School System, and Zamboanga State College of Marine Sciences and Technology. So to all our attendees from those schools, welcome, welcome to our webinar. Now, I know everyone is excited and eager to hear from our resource speaker. 
Uh, for us to get to know more about Attorney Jose Duc Bagulaya, I would like to call on one of my co-faculty from the Department of Language and Literature, Ms. Feli Rose Manawis, for the introduction of the speaker. Thank you, Benmar. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon to our speaker, to our guests, of course, fellow faculty and uh, our students from Far Eastern University. Our guest speaker for this afternoon is uh, Jose Duke Bagulaya, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Hong Kong. He's a faculty of law and assistant professor of comparative literature at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. He has participated in cause-oriented litigation in Manila, particularly in the Seldran case and the Lagman versus the Executive Secretary case in 2017. The latter is the first among several cases that challenged the declaration of martial law in Mindanao. He has published articles in peer-reviewed law, literary, and communications journals. His books, Literary History, Mode of Economic Production, 20th Century Waray Poetry, and Linara Nga Mga Pulong, Mga Sidai, translated as Woven Words, Poems, were published by the UP Press. Attorney Bagulaya's legal and interdisciplinary writings include ASEAN Aswayang Kulit, a critique of the constitutional, extra-constitutional, and practical fetters of ASEAN, published in the Asian Journal of International Law in 2019. The authors do not speak People's Reading of the ASEAN Charter, published in the Asian Journal of Law and Society, also in 2019. Between the Utopian Imaginaries of Literature and International Law, The Question of the Insurgent Child in International Legal Discourse, and Chris Montanez's Youth, in the Leiden Journal of International Law, which is a forthcoming publication. And most recently, Torture and Autobiography, a scary reading of self, rights, and revolution, in Luwalhati Milana Bruce Ton, Law and Literature, published by Cardoza Law School and Taylor and Francis in 2021. His third book, ASEAN as International Organization, is also forthcoming. Attorney Bagulaya is presently writing his dissertation on narratives of civil war and international law. So ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Attorney Jose Duke Bagulaya. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear, attorney. Okay. Um, good afternoon. I'd like to say thank you to everyone. Thank you for taking your time to listen to the organizers, the Department of Language and Literature of Far Eastern University, to the members of the faculty of FEU, um, especially Dr. Manny Gonzalez, Thank you. Of course, um, to the students, our future lawyers and writers and scholars, and to everyone who are listening right now, welcome and thank you. <clears throat> when, when Dr. Manny Gonzalez invited me to deliver a talk on the subject, language and literature as a way to legal studies, I was a bit hesitant. We know that Manila right now is experiencing surge in COVID cases, with 10,000 cases per day being recorded. One must wonder whether literature and law still matter. We ask, did we ask, why write, why read or listen to stories during a pandemic? Why give a lecture? I cannot give you an answer. But the greatest works of literature may suggest something. Giovanni Boccaccio's Decameron, which is a celebration of the earthly life, is framed by a story of a group of young men and women escaping from the Black Death to entertain themselves in the countryside. They tell all the stories that celebrate what Boccaccio calls the resurrection of the flesh. By that he means not the resurrection of the Holy Jesus Christ, 
but the resurrection of the monk Rustico's sexual instrument. Thus, amid so much death, humanity struggles for the resurrection of life, beautifully symbolized by Rustico's resurrection. Literature, indeed, is an expression of the human will to survive. That may be one reason why we can continue to talk about literature while experiencing death around us. And I also have another reason why I was hesitant to accept Dr. Gonzalez's invitation. You know what? Years ago, I, I taught at a university near FEU. Very long, not so very long. I taught journalism and literature there. And after one year, that was before I started teaching in the University of the Philippines. After one year, I was out of work. So like all unemployed, I started looking for a job. In short, I sent my application to FEU's Department of Language and Literature. You know, I got no reply. <laughs> in, in Tagalog, they say, lintik lang ang walang ganti. You know, I know someone who is in a very powerful position and who always follows and practices that principle. He sends people to jail, he closes businesses, and more. Based on my personal knowledge, he is not Tagalog, but he is a lawyer. I considered following his example, <laughs> but then I tried to be philosophical about the invitation. You know, retribution in law need not be in the same form. Law transforms our primitive notion of justice. That is revenge. It is transformed into something else. Criminal law, for instance, considers violations of an individual's person and rights by another individual as an offense against society. And thus criminal acts, the criminal acts punishment need not be the infliction of the same violence against the offender. In other words, I thought of more something more transformative. So I did not reject Dr. Gonzalez's invitation. The better form of retribution is to accept it and speak to the students of FEU now. That's the reason why I am now speaking to you years after failing to do so. Whether this form of trans um, retribution will be good for everyone, I leave it to you to decide. Anyhow, I am simply grateful to FEU for giving me this opportunity to speak to future lawyers and scholars. Let me now turn to my topic, language and literature, the way to law. From the title of this lecture, you may deduce that I will argue that the best preparation for legal studies is a bachelor in language and literature. This proposition may not be as popular as a widely held belief that political science is the best way to law studies. I mention this belief because this is very popular. And as far as I know, it causes irritation among political science professors. Why? Aren't they happy about having so many students? Well, the more intelligent among them think that political science is not a preparation for law, as if the former is simply a means. For them, Paul Sy is a field in itself, and its knowledge production is not subordinate to legal knowledge. They are, of course, correct. These established fields, political science, literature, natural sciences, are not inferior to law. Their knowledge production in our country is in fact superior to our legal scholarship. Our scholars in these fields are more recognized abroad than our lawyers. Sad truth is that few 
lawyers from our country get to publish in the most prestigious journals. Legal scholarship, that is the production of original legal knowledge, remains marginal and inferior. But why do we still think highly of the legal profession? Of lawyers? I think it is because the Philippines is a former American colony inherited a system where lawyers have a very high status. Our presidents for good and ill were mostly lawyers, just like the Americans. In the old days, the governors usually came from the office of the prosecutor. Quezon and Osmania were former provincial prosecutors. Of course, times have changed. Bourgeoisie or capitalist class have taken those positions previously held by lawyers. Elections are costly nowadays and lawyers do not earn billions. So fewer lawyers get elected to high positions. And yet, despite these changes, lawyers still hold power because the system cannot stand without law. If a comedian becomes senator, you know that he cannot draft the bill by himself. He must hire a lawyer. Even the bourgeoisie cannot keep their property without law. As the critical legal scholars in the US put it, the rule of law to a certain extent is the rule by lawyers. In a constitutional order, you need lawyers to master the system. Even Don Vito Carleone, the mafia boss in The Godfather had a lawyer son. When asked why he established a big law firm, the devil in the film, the devil's advocate answered, the law puts us into everything. Indeed, there is almost nothing important to humanity that is not governed by law. Territories, states, sea, war, outer space, trade, investments, they are all governed by law. If you want to launch a satellite, you need a lawyer who knows the relevant treaties governing satellites. If a state wants to impose taxes on foreign products, it needs a lawyer who knows the WTO treaty. If a state wants to claim the seas, it needs lawyers to know what it can explicitly claim without appearing like a fool. Knowledge of the law is important in governing things and relations. Lawyers therefore become indispensable. And this is the source of their power. This power in turn attracts us, students. But law is more than power. Law is also about the human quest for justice. It was cause-oriented litigation that overturned legal segregation in the US. At the height of decolonization, international law gave anti-colonial movements the license to use force against imperialists. It interpreted violent resistance to colonialism as a form of self-defense, which remains a valid use of force, whether in international law or in criminal law. In this last example, we can also recognize the malleability of law, international law, which justified imperialist appropriation of inhabited islands and continents turns against itself. The malleability of law, others call it indeterminacy, also makes law an interesting object of study. This indeterminacy springs from its linguistic nature. Because law is language, it inherits the latter's openness. Like language, law is also subject to interpretation. It is subject to language games where meaning is simply unstable and keeps unmoving. While court decisions aim for stability, it is widely known that courts also change their decisions. In the US, Supreme Court once affirmed statutes outlawing homosexual acts. Then years later, the court reversed the earlier decision and struck such crimes from the statute books, declaring them unconstitutional. Thus people try to enter the door of the law for various reasons for power, for money, for justice, for intellectual reasons. Like Franz Kafka's character in Before the Law, 
aspiring lawyers wait before the door and wait for the door's guard to let them in. Some are allowed inside, others fail. In our country, the bar examination is the ultimate test. For this reason, legal education is geared towards the bar examination. Legal education is like a horse whose eyesight has been fixed in one direction. As many critics have pointed out, this bar-oriented legal education makes the vision of our law students rather limited. It is in this context that I think the study of language and literature becomes relevant. The study of language and literature can prepare us for legal studies in its limited bar-oriented sense and its broader sense of interdisciplinary legal scholarship. I will only discuss three ways. First, the study of language and literature should provide you with the skills of reading and writing. Second, it allows you to have an interdisciplinary perspective. Third, it introduces you to narrative master codes that are useful in arguing a position. So I'll discuss first the skills. The coursework in law school and the bar exam require a mastery of language that is English. To survive law school, you need to read appellate decisions and write clearly. In fact, each day in law school is a reading class. You have to read Supreme Court interpretations and legal codes for your daily classes. You will spend many hours reading. Many students think about the recitation, but that is secondary. You have nothing to recite if you did not read, or you read but did not understand. You also need to develop your writing skills in law school. Well, my experience of the bar exam is limited since I only took it once. I don't want to take it again and experience it. I can tell you that the bar exam is really a writing contest. It demands both a clarity of expression and a swift execution. Both reading and writing skills are things that can be learned from a serious study of language and literature. We are required to read novels, poetry, and essays. Well, they will not tell us about constitutional powers. There is something more important that we learn from them. As we study the best that has been thought and written by humankind, we learn to be sensitive readers, and we also learn to write well. In contrast, other courses may require us to study substantive law. A business student is required to study obligations and contracts, thus he learns the substance of law. If you use force against a person, force a person to sign a contract, such contract is voidable. Political science is study of governmental institutions, which are often also legal institutions. That is why the two fields are closely related in institutional studies. Paul Sai may give you an idea of the nature of presidential power, but it will not train you how to express it well. What humanities can offer to you is not the substance of law. Rather, it is the skills you need as a lawyer. Interdisciplinarity. Study of language and literature also offers us a broad vision and enlarges our horizon, develops an interdisciplinary perspective. As a fluid category, literature includes many forms of writings. They include history, philosophy, autobiography, essays, drama, poetry, novels. It allows us to explore many fields. One day you can read the Roman historian Tacitus denouncing the shamelessness of Tiberius. The next day you can read Giorgio Gambin's legal track on the state of exception. Then you can read Kafka's novel, The Trial. As a study of language and literature introduces us to many writings, it also gives us a broader understanding of law. It allows us to read law in a new way and expand the meaning of law. Law is no longer simply what the law books say, 
law becomes accessible to other non-legal viewpoints. As a result, the monopoly of legal interpretations by lawyers and courts is destroyed and law becomes a site of contending visions. This opening of law to various perspectives and interpretations would raise the level of our legal scholarship. Along the way, original thinking about law and it would be produced, published, and debated upon by more people. Master Codes. Stories are important to human beings. We learn about ourselves through stories. In fact, if you ask who am I, your answer would be in the form of a story. We even vote for politicians because of their stories. They tell you that they will end the drug problem in six months. They will stop corruption. They are simple folks who blow a candle on a cup of rice rather than a cake. In the Visayas, when we don't want to believe in another person's tale, we say, Historiahe, tell me a story. Literature is a study of stories, of narratives. Through our readings, we become familiar with what we call master codes. David fighting Goliath, Moses liberating the Israelites from Egyptian bondage, Antigone resisting the unjust laws of Crayon. We know this master code as well because they reappear in various retelling. Antigone's resistance becomes anti-fascist resistance in occupied France. The Count of Monte Cristo becomes Rizal Simon in a colonial context. In the legal world, we also tell the stories of our clients. Indeed, when we submit a complaint or an answer, we tell a story. When someone is accused of rape, the usual defense is, I am too handsome to force her. So our courts call this the boyfriend theory. Meanwhile, the woman's lawyer tells us about the oppression of women. The woman is represented as a Maria Clara. The judge listens to all these stories. Legal arguments are more often presented in the form of a story. And what kind of story is more appealing to audiences? Of course, the master codes are mythical narratives that structure the human mind. Stories that shape our minds from childhood. Stories that shape a nation's collective unconscious. It is no wonder that we call a trial a contest of narratives. The study of literature will prepare you for fierce narrative contests. To summarize my talk, the study of language and literature provides us with the skills of reading and writing. It allows us to understand law broadly. It allows us to tell a good story in court. These are reasons why you should take your study of literature and language seriously. If you take your literature courses seriously, and later on you become a lawyer, you might eventually become a lawyer who is also a writer. And that would be no mean feat. As Judge Richard Posner says, few lawyers become writers, but fewer still are the writers who become lawyers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Attorney Bagulaya. I hope our attendees all enjoyed and learned a lot from our speaker sharing. Well, aside from Attorney Bagulaya, we also have a panel of reactors uh, joining us this afternoon, and they will share with us their insights about uh, what Attorney Bagulaya shared with us and about language and literature in the field of law. We are joined by uh, two of my co-faculty, uh, Mari Ms. Maria Veronica Carillo and attorney Ethaldreda Ferrer Dadulia. And also we have a student reactor with us, uh, a language and literature studies student uh, from FEU, Robin Shari Monzon. I believe we are going to hear first from uh, Ms. Maria Veronica Carillo. Ms. Nika. Yeah, thank you, Sir Venmar. Good afternoon, Attorney Jose and to the rest of the attendees. 
So welcome to this webinar. Good afternoon. Okay. Um, I may not uh, fully comprehend the legal part of what attorney said. Okay. Uh -huh. Parang na nosebleed ako doon. Okay. <laughs> the legal part. But uh, definitely, uh, if I may share my insights, I totally agree with attorney uh, when he mentioned that uh, if you're planning to take up law in the future and then uh, you take up language and lit, uh, you really have to take it seriously. Okay, really seriously, because uh, aside from what Attorney Jose mentioned, okay, uh, if you are to be a lawyer, okay, uh, aside from being a lawyer, you can also be a writer, okay? So it's, uh, I think it's a very good combination because to be a lawyer, uh, it requires really uh, reading, okay, comprehensive reading, uh, especially if you're under the uh, English language and literature track, okay, you will be exposed to plenty of readings, okay, whether novels, okay, um, stories, poetry, okay, you learn to be sensitive. That's very, very important. Diba? When you become lawyers, you also have to understand your, your clients, okay, you have to be exposed to different people from all walks of life, okay, so I totally agree with him. Uh, you can be a lawyer, you can be a writer, and uh, probably you can also uh, publish your paper in a reputable journal. Because also, attorney also mentioned earlier that not all legal professionals or lawyers are given the chance to publish in a reputable journal. Okay, so I think this will be a very good opportunity. Okay, and uh, aside from that, I think. Um, if you plan to be a uh, good, really good lawyers in the future, as early as now, while you are in college or you are about to enter college, okay, you should start practicing and exposing yourself to different uh, genres of reading, different reading materials. Okay, it will definitely help you. Okay, uh, if I may mention, uh, like in my case, I am actually a mass communications graduate. Okay. Uh, but I uh, took up English, and then eventually I became a teacher. So I think that's also an added advantage for me because I was exposed to uh, communications and then English and then education. So for me, the more, the more you learn, the better. Because you can, uh, you can help not just uh, yourself, your colleagues, but other people as well. And then uh, before I uh, uh, give the floor to the next reactor, I would like to quote what Attorney Jose mentioned earlier that law is more than power. Okay, I believe that law is more than power. Law is uh, subject to interpretation and analysis as well, just like language. Okay, if you know how to, uh, if you know how to, to communicate well in the proper context, then you can easily be understood by people. You cannot be misinterpreted by other people because that's where problems come in if you are misunderstood by other people. So if you know how to communicate well in the proper context, definitely uh, you can apply that when you enter the legal profession. Okay. So I think that's all for me, Sir Venmar. Thank you, Ms. Carrillo. Thank you very okay. much for sharing with us your insight. Now, uh, we will have another reactor who is a student of Language and Literature Studies in FEU Manila. We have Robin Shelly Monzon. Robin? Hello. Good afternoon po sa lahat. Um, For me, my reaction on this webinar by Attorney Bagulaya is that what he had reiterated and discussed about the language of law was truly insightful and enlightening, especially for students interested in this field. What more is that as a first year student under the Department of Language and Literature Studies, the image of law as a profession is something not far fetched, and that law is language and it carry and as quoted to, uh, to attorney Bagolaya, law is language and it inherits the latter's openness. It means that language, li like law, must be interpreted. Furthermore, from the discussion, I realized that language, literature, 
and law have one common factor, and that is culture. Language and its true studies allow us to have an interdisciplinary perspective. By exploring different genres, you allow yourself to have an in-depth understanding of law. From a simple bill or reading, you can connect it to societal issues in today's time, creating an aware and eloquent tradition. Narratives are also important to provide a vivid scenario for evidence or testimonies used for legal procedures. And these stories are delivered through the essence and art of language and its truth. Lastly, as a student who just like any other students that saw law as something scary because of its strict and serious nature, the course language and literature studies opened the path which I did not acknowledge before, and that being language as the bridge and vital foundation of law. And to end this to end my reaction, um one what had Attorney Bagulaya mentioned earlier that law transforms our primitive notion of justice, and that is revenge. It, why it remains striking to me is because it shows how language, law, and literature can transform something, um, something that was not that civilized before into something more beautiful and more like organized in today's time. Po. Yun lang po. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, Robin. And now, um, let's hear from Attorney Ethaldreda Ferrer de Dulia. Attorney? Okay, thanks, Benmar. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will not contradict anything that my panero mentioned earlier. Okay, I actually agree with everything um, because I'm also a lit major myself. So uh, I, I do fully uh, agree with what uh, he said. But I just want to react to a few points. Okay, probably just uh, add a few of my insights and when while he uh, was justifying quote unquote justifying uh, the need to take up law uh, and then he mentioned the will to, uh, the will it is actually the will to survive and why we still need it um, during these times when when people seem to be uh, to think that it um, taking up law is not that important or even literature for that matter. I wanted to type uh, in the chat section earlier, but I just uh, tried to keep it to myself for this moment. Uh, I wanted to answer to turn the barbaric urges civilized. And that is what literature has actually been doing since the beginning. Um, and then um, it's a, it, it was a good thing that uh, Attorney Bagulaya uh, mentioned the three um, good points that you would, uh, uh, the, the three things, okay, the good points about taking up literature, language and literature as a pre-law subject. Okay. When he, when he talked about so many, um, the history of law as well as it's in the importance of literature, he noticed that Attorney Bagulaya showed the interdisciplinary nature of literature. He did not just talk about law, as a lot of people would uh, uh, expect from a lawyer, he talked about how law is related to literature, how literature is related to history and um, general information and so on. You notice how he mentioned not only pertinent laws, he also mentioned the Cameron, he mentioned Kafka, and to those who are into pop culture, you mentioned the devil's advocate. Okay. Of course, the Keanu Reeves fans uh, in, the, in the audience probably were more than pleased to hear him mention uh, the devil's advocate. Okay. He also mentions that this um, people also acquire skills uh, in reading okay, and writing when one takes up language and literature. You do not know, uh, to those who are still contemplating what, on what course to take, the amount of readings a language and literature major has to grapple with in the undergrad is so voluminous that by the time they reach law school, they've already gotten used to so being assigned to read so many things that being given so many cases to read in law school would be a breeze 
of course, that's in quotation marks. The 150 cases a day is not a breeze, but at least okay, the system has gotten used to it. Okay. And then Attorney Bagulay also ma mentions the master codes. When he does, when he does, uh -huh. when he does mention, or when he did mention that, he was actually referring to what? Okay, uh, an archetypal analysis. Okay, of a human being. So you get to see a more, um, a more rounded or a better view of a person. It's not just one side. Hey, he mentions how a person could be depicted Maria Clara at one point and another type of person in the next. And um, just to end this, uh, uh, my, my, my point, okay, um, when, when Attorney Bagulay mentions it's actually rare that a lawyer becomes a writer, or a, it's actually, uh, there's a bigger chance of a writer becoming a lawyer, and th if there's one lawyer, writer that you'd probably admire, it would be Justice Sagani Cruz. You would love reading his cases. It's like reading a literature, a literary analysis. And he's one example of somebody who's really good at writing, who is also a lawyer. That's all. Thank you very much, Attorney. And hi to Peter. Hi, Peter. Yeah. Going Sorry to for the extra baby. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you very much to our panel of reactors, uh, Ms. Veronica Carillo, Robin Shelley, and Attorney uh, Ferrer de Dulia. Thank you very much. Now, Attorney Bagulay will answer some questions that uh, were sent to us during the presentation. Uh, but before we look into the questions of our attendees, I, I have one question to Attorney Bagulay. Attorney Bagulay, are you there? Yes. Hi, attorney. Hello. Hello, po. Um, I would just like to to ask for a recommendation, po. So, for most of our viewers, um, who I believe are fond of reading, who are into reading literature or literary works that have something to do with law, any recommendation, po, that you would give? Oh well, um, Shakespeare. Your if you're familiar with Shakespeare. Shakespeare talks a lot about law. Um, my my favorite, of course, is um, The Merchant of Venice. And it's discussion there is how you interpret the contract. So um, whether you interpret it liberally or literally. And so it, it gives us an idea how interpretation works and what matters in interpretation. So um, I, I would cite that um, work of Shakespeare, The Merchant of Venice. But another um, work that you can um, read is Franz Kafka's um, The Trial. So it's really about um, the a character who is tried but does not really know what his offense is so is wondering why is he being tried at all because and that, that kind of absurdity always happens you know when governments become abusive under dictatorships you just suddenly become or become an accused so law becomes a weapon against individuals and so you you become um, a victim of of the state and that is also how or why rights are very important because rights are your um, rights generally are your security against abuse of the state so um, that's that's a, that's a work that should be read by anyone interested in law. So Merchant of Venice um, in Shakespeare. Measure for Measure is also a good one um, by Shakespeare. Um, Kafka. So Kafka was a lawyer, so he, he really talked about law. So the trial, before the law, 
um, and many, many others who just um, check out Kafka's book. But um, what else? Um, in, in Philippine yes. literature, you can also check out um, works like um, Guerra by Ruth Permesa. It talks about the civil war in the countryside. And that's really, although it's not, does not really talk directly about law, you will be able to imagine why law should govern our civil wars. You therefore look for law in its absence, not in its presence. So there are a lot of things that I can recommend that then. Um, and, but if you are into law and literature, Richard Posner actually wrote a book um, describing the, the whole field, so, um, law and literature. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Attorney Bagulaya. Thank you for those recommendations. Um, Attorney Bagulayo, now we have a question from our um, audience. It's from Kuya Jet Ramos. Uh, good afternoon. I am a 36-year-old teacher, media personality, corporate communications practitioner, and columnist. Would it not be too late for me to major in law? I am a BSE major in English graduate, and some of my friends have been nudging me to pursue law studies. Attorney oh. Bagulayo. Oh, there, there is really nothing. Um, I can't say you're late in taking up law because I myself did not study law right after college. I was really more interested in literature. So I, I decided to study um, literature first. I went to take up master's. So um, it was only later on that I studied law, so I, I don't think it's a problem. You can you can study law um, after in your mid thirties or even forties. It's there's nothing that should stop you from. Um, in fact, when you take law and you came from other fields, um, your your way of viewing law should be broader than ordinary lawyers. So it, I think that's an advantage. Of course, the problem in taking um, law legal studies in our country is that um, it's really very um, technical and bar oriented. So in the end, you might not really enjoy it. And uh, the problem with law school is that it is studied after college but then they say it's like going back to high school because you keep reciting. So it's not something that you'll really, you'd really enjoy. So you have to consider that. And I think that's really the problem also with our legal education. Why is legal education being taught like it's high school where you have to recite and it's, there must be a debate about that kind of education. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Bagulaya. Okay, Jet Ramos, we also would like to thank you, Attorney, for answering uh, the question. Um, okay. Um, he also, I think, Kuya Jet also is inviting you, Attorney Bagulaya, to be uh, his guest for the May 2 episode of my show, Pentuhan with Kuya Jet. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so do we have any other questions from our attendees? Anybody else who would like to ask Attorney Bagulaya a question about language and literature, about law? Uh, feel free to type it in the comment uh, section or in the chat box. All right, so um, Attorney Bagulaya, while we are waiting for other questions to come in, um, I'm not sure if this has something to do with language and literature, but I think it has something to do with law. And one of the, the news on television that I, I do see regularly, it's about the, the conflict in West Philippine Sea right now. 
And I all oh, I keep on hearing the this thing diplomatic protest. Um, if you would like to to just um let us um understand what a diplomatic protest is. Let's say, for example, the Philippines would file a di- diplomatic protest. What exactly would happen in in that course of action? Uh, um, I, I really cannot um cannot answer you about um. A diplomatic protest because it's mm-hmm. a diplomatic protest. I guess it's it's more political than really mm-hmm. legal. Okay, so it it's it's a it's a government statement. Yes, of so it's it's not necessarily a legal statement. So um, that's why sometimes it is often ignored because it's really a political statement. Although in international law, if you study international law, it also it is also difficult even when you have a judgment, it's also very difficult to implement or execute it. Because often in international law, it's always the consent of states that really matter. So when states think that they have not consented in being sued, then they can always try to ignore the law. Of course, the exception to state consent is when you you sign a treaty where you give in advance your consent to be sued. So that's another story. But the problem, of course, with that is when you execute the judgment based on that, there is still no policeman or court that will really execute it. So it's more like um, when you have a judgment, it's more like it's a self-implementation um, or self-execution. You, you just execute it against yourself. So that's always a problem with, with international law. All right. Thank you very much, Attorney Babilaya. Um, Attorney Bab- uh, Babilaya, we have another question from our attendees, uh, one of our attendees, um, from Julia Francesca. Hi, do you have any law school recommendation here in the Philippines? <laughs> <laughs> How can we answer that question, Attorney Babilaya? <laughs> I really cannot. It, it's, it's a matter of choice where you want to study law. So I don't want to endorse any law school. <laughs> okay. But... Um, of course, the legal profession has always been hierarchical, and it's very similar also to the whole educational system. So you have to consider that those things. Okay. But to to tell you where to go, I think I should not do that. <laughs> <laughs> But I think uh, just to I think to add up to that question, Attorney Babilaya, let's say someone is considering to to get into law school. I think um, like what consideration you should you know take into consideration when choosing a law school. Like what do you have to uh, to to research on or to take into consideration before deciding that I would go to this particular law school. Well. Um... The, the problem, of course, with, with law education in, the, in our countries, it's almost the same. They're all the same. Mm-hmm. They don't offer any difference, except maybe that in some schools, they really get the best students and sometimes also the best teachers. So they always get the best training. So that does not necessarily... Um, reflect about the quality of education. So, it's, um, my, 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 there is really, if you examine the curriculum of the law schools, they're the same because it's bar oriented. So, I don't see any difference. Mm-hmm. Okay. If right. I can only say that there is, you go to this law school, if they really offer something very different, but since they are all concerned with passing the bar, taking 
or getting a high percentage of passers, they almost look the same for me. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Attorney Babulaya. Um, we have a question here from Erika Sagan, Attorney. Uh, good day, Attorney. I'm a first-year BA language and literature student at Far Eastern University. My question would be, what can you say to the students who are aspiring to be lawyers but are currently experiencing doubts when it comes to pursuing Well, you have to ask what you really want to do in life. It's, it's, a, personal, it's a personal thing. So um, you have to decide what you want to do in life. Because that's always, a, uh, that's always a good question because even when you become a lawyer, you still ask that. Now I'm a lawyer, I still try to ask myself, what should I do? Should I teach? Should I study? Should I become a scholar? Should I litigate? So it's a matter of what you want to do for so long. So it, it's a very personal question. You, you have to decide it mm -hmm. based on your preference. What kind of life will give you um, pleasure, would make your life worth living? Well, some people think that making money is very good. Then they do it. But I myself, I don't think I, I like that kind of life. So um, I enjoy more, I enjoy writing, I enjoy reading. So that's the kind of life I, I have litigated, I joined litigation, but I also don't think that I will enjoy it for very long. So I, after litigating for a few years, I went to, um, study law again. Okay. Okay, so attorney, uh, we have a few more questions. Um, so uh, one here is, being a literature graduate and having a prolific career in the academe, what made you decide to take up law, attorney Babulaya? Okay, I think the, the main question, uh, the, the, my, my answer to that is that it's already there in my lecture. Law is an interesting object of study. Mm -hmm. That's that's the main reason. So it was really more like an intellectual thing for me. Although there are various reasons, of course. One is um, economic. Another, of course, is um, um, more practical. You want to do something other than reading and writing then you litigate. So it's also something that is practice. But um, for, for me, I decided to take up law because I want to write about it. I want to think about it. That was my first option. And, and I think eventually I did, I, I, I achieved that. So, um, and I think that that's also what I'm going to do in the near, um, in the coming years. So I'll continue to think about law, write about it. So that that was the main reason for my legal studies. But there are many things that you can do with law, of course. So you can practice law, you can teach it, you can think about it, you can write about it. You can see its relations to other things. So it really depends. For some people, it, it's power. Others, it's money. Mm -hmm. So, but I, 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 I'm not into that, of course. Okay. All right. Um, um, thank you very much, Attorney Babulaya. Um, another one here is um, a part-time instructor at FU Roosevelt Kainta, uh, Shara Mia Espigo. Um, I'm glad I found your announcement regarding this webinar because I'm also an aspiring lawyer, but I think financial burdens are a big problem. What is your take on that, um, Attorney Babulaya? 
well, we all, we all have financial problems. <laughs> we, we always have uh, um, financial problems. And of course, it's worse for others. And uh, that's always a problem. But when you come to think of it, law is not necessarily that difficult because there are there are schools that are quite, um, I mean, in terms of tuition, it's quite cheaper. Mm-hmm. So unlike med- medicine, law is still, I think, a poor man's um, course still possible medicine is really more expensive Mm -hmm. when you when you compare the two so it's just a matter of um really trying your best maybe to work and study law Mm -hmm. i also worked when i was studying law so i was not a full-time law student Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I was teaching literature and then after lit- teaching, I would try to sleep and <clears throat> then <clears throat> read for my law classes at night. So eventually I finish it. So we all need money and uh, you can work and you can study. Although, of course, it really depends also on the time you spend studying law. So if you don't have the time to read, it will be more difficult for you. But it's it's a matter of um, doing your best and trying to find time so that you can read. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Attorney Bagulaya. Attorney, I hope it's okay. We have a few more questions. Would that be okay? Um, it's okay. What time is it? Uh, we still have um, like uh, five more minutes. Would that be okay to to entertain questions? Uh, no, no problem. All right. We... Okay, so attorney, good afternoon. I'm an English major student from Capital University. Is it okay for an aspiring lawyer to read law fiction stories to get ideas in understanding the nature of law? Uh, well, you know. If you, when when you read fiction, you don't have to believe it literally because fiction is a production. It's mediated. It does not reflect reality in a one-way uh, reflection. It's not really a reflection. It's more like mediated. So, um, but definitely, literary works can also tell you about how law works. But you have to be very careful, of course. That's why literature is also complex. Because if you you have to see the nuances of literary production. So that that's only my my warning. Because what you see in literature, what you see in movies, they're not really (laughs) They're not really how law works. Because, of course, when you watch a, a material in the movie, it's a scripted, it's staged. Yeah. It's more boring in real, in, in reality. Mm-hmm. You commit a lot of mistakes. Okay. Lawyers don't necessarily um, present their best every day in the trial but it's different when you watch a, 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 um, a trial scene in the movie so um, that does not necessarily reflect quotidian um, legal practice okay um second to the last question attorney um uh, from one of our students in um feu uh, taking language and literature uh, uh, from Darcy Summer Carpiso. So I had a discussion with a friend recently revolving around the ethics of law as a job. Is it true that being a lawyer can be seen as dirty work? Especially here in the Philippines where potential clients range from innocent people to corrupt politicians. 
do you have to let go of your own personal morals just because it's your job? Well, that's the um, legal practice does not necessar necessarily mean you have to give up certain principles, including um, ethics. Um, it's 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 not like that. Um, you can still practice without using money. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know how how legal practice is done in the Philippines, and. Um, it's not, it's really far from ideal, but it doesn't mean all lawyers are like that. So I, I know some, I, I still know, I know a lot of lawyers who will not use money to win a case. And I think I prefer that kind of legal practice. Mm -hmm. And you have to tell the client that I am not here to make you win whatever it costs. That should be clear to the client. I mean, I am your lawyer, but I will not bribe everyone <laughs> to make you win. I'll do this in the most um, decent way. So if we lose, that should be, uh, we're not going to lose this, but definitely I'm not going to go around town bribing people to make you win and i don't think that's that's a very good idea of lawyering but but of course the reality is different and um, but even if it's real we don't need to affirm that kind of reality or support that kind of practice so <clears throat> there's always a way to to have a uh, good law lawyering good practice not okay. not what you call dirty work yes okay. all right so it looks like um there's a lot there's still a lot of questions from our um attendees uh, Tony Bagulay. they're very interested to know more but due to time constraint i think uh, let's have one last question um and this question is from um another uh, from a student from Central Luzon uh, State University. I am a Bachelor of Arts and Literature at Central Luzon State University. I want to know po if what specialization of law is best to take for literature graduates? Oh, what specialization? Well, um, you really don't have any specialization when you take your law degree. Mm -hmm. um, ba based on my experience, you, you do that eventually when you are practicing. And because in order to, par uh, to pass the bar, you have to study every all subjects. So there's no such thing as a specialization. You have to pass all the subjects like remedial law, criminal law, mm -hmm. um, political law, all of this, you have to treat them more or less equally. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't like tax law, but I really took it seriously. So, um, all, yeah, I, I mean, the, the less interested you are in that subject, the more time you should spend, time. Um, spend yeah. in studying it because you're not good at it. Mm -hmm. So my, the, the point is you have to pass every subject first. And then later on, when you are a lawyer, you just decide what kind of um, field you want to do it or practice. Well, um, if you're starting, I don't think you can really have so much choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it depends. But it will also, also um, maybe we, you, when you, after trying, practicing for a little time, then you can really decide um, what is interesting to you. All right. Okay. So um, thank you, everyone, for your questions. And of course, to our research speaker, Atorni Bagulaya, for answering them. Thank you very much, Atorni. And to show our appreciation of your time and presence and sharing with us your knowledge and experience, 
I would like to call on my co-faculty from the Department of Language and Literature, Mr. Persius Balog, for the awarding of certificate. Um, thank you, um, Sir Ben Mark. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear And thank you so much, um, Attorney Bagolaya. So for the Certificate of Appreciation, the Far Eastern University Institute of Arts and Sciences would like to award their, the Certificate of Appreciation to Attorney Jose Duke Bagolaya for sharing his expertise as resource speaker during the webinar entitled Language and Literature, The Way to Law, given this 13th day of April, 2021 at Far Eastern University, Manila, signed by Dr. Emmanuel Gonzalez, Department Chair of the Department of Language and Literature and Dr. Rowena Kapulong Reyes, the Dean of the Institute of Arts and Sciences. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Balog, and thank you, Attorney uh, Bagulaya. Thank you, now, Attorney. Now, before we uh, conclude the program, before we hear from the president of the Literature Society, let's have a photo opportunity with our resource speaker. So may we request our attendees, if you could uh, turn your cameras on, and we can have, uh, you know, take screenshots of us with our resource speaker. So... Uh, Miss Anne, or is it Miss Desiree who would take screenshots of our picture? Ba? Is it going to be Miss Anne? Yes, sir. Okay, wow. Well. Alright, so sa ating pong attendees, uh, may we request kung sino po yung available mag-turn ng cameras nila para po makapag-take po tayo ng picture with uh, Attorney Bagulaya. Okay, so Miss Anne, may mga nag na po ba ng camera? Yes, sir. Okay. First page po. Smile. <laughs> Second page. Smile. Third yes. page. So, hindi natin alam kung nasang page tayo, no? Basta smile na lang po tayo. Third <laughs> page. Smile the picture. Okay na po, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank much. you. Now, to formally close our webinar, I would like to call on the president of the FEU's Literature Society, Ms. Desiree Banyares. Desiree? So before we officially end the program, we would like to take this final opportunity to appreciate everyone who came and took part in our event today. Um, also, please be reminded to answer um, the evaluation form for this specific event and help us in providing you with better leadership and services as the Department of Language and Literature. So to the faculty and students of Far Eastern University, our, our program reactor, senior high school students, and other external guests, and also our moderator, um, thank you so much for being here and contributing to the success of the event. Um, the Department of Language and Literature, including its academic organizations, FEU, LITSOC, and DLC, are faithful in its service of expanding the horizons of our learners. Um, every event we release and share with everyone is an attempt to supplementing your growth, amplifying your voices, and raising opportunities. So today, we hope that you acquire the courage and drive to take your academic and professional pursuits to the next level. And if it is law school, then so be it. Um, to my fellow students, I would like to reiterate um, that as much as the field of law is a formal and political legal process, it is also a social cultural encounter um, and one that is human humanized further with a deep appreciation and understanding for language and literature. And we are learning about facets of communication and human experiences through theories, discourse, narratives, representation, poetics, and so on. And we are taught to speak right to read, listen, empathize, and enlighten ourselves through the process of our education, all of which can be used to contribute to the enrichment of society. But besides building skill, um, I would like to pose such questions in relation to this um, discourse is that what is linguistic expression if not transformative assertions of human nature and social systems like we have learned today what is justice and principle if not governed by visceral experiences and profound pursuits 
um, and language and literature deals with functions of representation and thought that are essential to social political development. Um, but like our, our speaker has shared, such cases must still be approached with a critical mind and interpretation as movement and narratives, um, which will later lead into the fueling of institutional and ideological evolution. So um, basically, the literary mind shares with the legal eye a truth-seeking passion. It is something that is core to both our pursuits of writing, reading, and also creating policies. We are seeking and creating and reproducing a matter of perspective and truth to the public, to the masses, for their benefit. Um, and the eloquent tongue brings to the table persuasion unrivaled. Um, if you leave today, with law as one of your career options or we have helped you in some way strengthen that passion then we consider ourselves fulfilled as organizers speakers and contributors of um, the webinar so on behalf of the department of language and Lit literature i would extend our deepest gratitude to attorney jose duke bagulaya for sharing his knowledge and time with us today and we are so thankful for the institute of arts and sciences whose support and encouragement has been vital to our program and of course the far eastern university um, for being a um, beacon of basic our, our educational system as well so um, we are glad that we got to meet you all today here um, and we hope to see you in in our future events. So um, stay tuned for our podcast episodes and open mic sessions in the coming months in cooperation with the Department of Language and Literature. And once again, I am Desiree T. Banyares from the FEU Literature Society. Um, thank you and stay safe. And again, please be reminded to answer the evaluation form. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much, Desiree. So just like what Desiree mentioned, I hope that we get, uh, see you guys um, as, you know, Tamarels in the future and take language and literature in preparation for your law uh, profession in the future. So again, thank you very much for taking the time to join us this afternoon. And let us all end this informative and uh, productive webinar with the FEU hymn. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.